It's a pleasure to be here this morning and have the honor to moderate this panel with our guests here. And I'd like to very briefly introduce them. Of course, there is in your uh, materials there some biographical information. But first, on your far right, is Lenny Villapando. And Mr. Villapando has been working since 1999 in Broward County. And he serves currently as the Environmental Licensing and Building and Permitting Division Director. He's a professional engineer specializing in water permitting and uh, floodplain man FEMA floodplain management. And before moving to Broward County, he worked for Wolpert LLP as a water resources engineer. And let's see, next we have Matisse Cohn. And he started his career as a financial consultant at Prudential Bach and Merrill Lynch. And then he moved on to hold some key executive positions in both pub public and private companies. Uh, including responsibility for over half of uh, over 500 million dollars in transactions and development in Israel, Hungary, Slovakia, and the United Kingdom. And now, uh, Mr. Cohen is working right here in Southeast Florida as principal for the Kahuna properties, and he works with the North in North Beach master planners, city administration, and community leaders. And he's finding ways to help revitalize North Beach to become a thriving Miami Beach neighborhood that serves the needs of residents, local businesses, and visitors alike. Um, and finally, uh, immediately next to me here, we have Scott Robbins, who is the head of Scott Robbins Companies, founder. And Mr. Robbins um, has grown this company into a, ver into a mid-sized, vertically integrated real estate development firm specializing in development, construction, leasing, and com commercial property management. And Mr. Robbins is also serving currently as the chair of Miami Beach's Blue Ribbon Committee on Sea Level Rise. So we have some great expertise here in the room up on the panel, and I'd like to invite you also, we want this to be very conversational, so all the panelists have agreed or that if you have questions while this is going on, just feel free to raise your hand, we'll recognize you, and then if you can move to one of the microphones, and you can go ahead and ask questions during this. We Again, we really want it to be conversational. So starting then, I'll ask a kind of general question that all three of you can kind of chime in on. and. That is, how challenging is it to get peers in the development community uh, to discuss sea level rise? And I guess also with Lenny, if, if that comes up at all with permit applicants. I can start. Um, the discussion of sea level rise, especially in the development community, is a very uncomfortable question. It's, uh, it's tough to get people to, to talk about it because of all the unknowns and how scary it is, um, the the development community really looks to the government to you know help them formulate their their uh, you know their approach to to development. It's um, it's a very uh, see I, I'm I'm part of the development community and it's you know certain codes today are written that don't take any level of sea, rise, sea level rise into account and uh, the government right now is also trying to develop those criteria to, to instruct the development community about sea level rise. So right now it's, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's unknown. Developers always like to know what's going on. They always like to be able to understand what their insurance costs are going to be. They want to understand what their financing costs are going to be. When, when you introduce sea level rise, you know, the big unknown for, for not only locally, but, but for our world, it creates this level of uncertainty. And, you know, for me as a developer, it's important that you know, we get educated, we understand what we're doing, we, we uh, we come up with codes and ordinances that, that, that build resiliency into our system. I mean, we're, we're a group of guys that like to follow rules. We want to know what the rules are. And whatever the rules are, we'll follow them. But it's important for us as developers to have a set of rules, to have a set of guidelines. And, and we look to, to the, the local governments to provide those those sorts of guidelines are our, our, um, our, our scientists, our engineers, our, our local um, 
you know, politicians, you know, you know, we, we also have a, a, you know, a built environment that we work within and how we kind of mesh the new stuff with the old stuff. So it is, uh, it's uh, the development community really looks for guidance on this issue. And it's our, it's on our job collectively to provide the development community with guidance. Yes, please. Um, I'd like to add to Scott sits in a, a unique situation, uh, being a developer and a um, running the uh, mayor's blue ribbon panel on sea level rise, to be able to see it on both sides of the spectrum. I see it from a different perspective, and I think um, the narrative is a little different. Um, we can't quantify what will be, so we quantify what we can. So we know that we pay 30% of the flood insurance premiums of the United States. How many uh, disaster zones have there been declared in 2016 alone? How much money will be left for us? Um, the NFIP and, a and FEMA is not a very trusted agency where we pay um, premiums in the development, the property ownership, not the single family home, multifamily, commercial, retail, of premiums that have increased over 500% in the last couple of years. Now, everybody raised their hand when they saw, um, spoke about Andrew, and wind insurance premiums went through the roof. And what happened at that time? Citizens and other insurers sent inspectors to every property said, no, 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 you don't get that credit. I'm sorry. The straps that are holding your roof, that doesn't meet the requirement. And force people to make that investment and increase their premiums further. Now what's happening with flood? Insurance premiums went up, the cap went up, and now they're starting to send inspectors. Wait a second, you don't know the FEMA guidelines for mitigation? You have to build a moat around your house. I'm sorry, you have to install four uh, foot by seven foot vents below your home. Now that's a structural change. That's a tremendous investment. Okay, the next thing is we know that if you go to Freddie Mac, who was talking about the financing and government programs, and you say, okay, if I want to buy a property in New York, I'm paying three, five, 287 for a premium for AA property of interest rate through government programs, here you're paying four. The premium is built in. The risk is already built in, is what I'm saying. So going back to the question, is, is, are these the conversations these the that conversations, you're having with your colleagues? The conversations for the developers who are here to develop properties to stay with the, with the properties these are the conversations we're having right now. Okay, very good. But we're good. subsidizing this in general. Okay, thank you. Lenny, would you like to? Well, ask? as a regulator, you know, we sort of get to see all the projects as they're being planned and designed and built. And uh, I'll echo a lot of what Scott said, which is that when the developers come to us, you know, they're competing with all the other developments that we permitted. And the developer doesn't want to be the person that's building a few feet higher or, or taking into sea level rise if the other developers aren't because then they've got a non-competitive product. And they're also competing with the other existing uh, stock that might be out there. And so they tend to say, look, you know, I need to do what the, what the law requires me to do. I need to meet the minimum standards, not because I'm not interested in something that's more protective, but mostly because I need to be doing what the others are doing. And so they look at developments, and you tend to see them sort of follow whatever the minimum criteria are. That's what we end up. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Scott, you already kind of hit on the next question I was going to ask you, which is, in many cases, while local governments are much more informed about the increasing challenges of resilience moving forward, it was noted uh, by Ms. Henry earlier today that it can take significant time for local governments to respond, uh, even when they do have good data, to respond in their actual policy making and requirements. But yet what I'm hearing here is so she was intimating that maybe the development community needs to be proactive on this 
and what I'm hearing actually from kind of all three of you is the same thing, which is give us rules. So you don't think that it's a very viable option to be trying to promote that before local government can necessarily get specific rules in place the, to encourage the development community to move the ball forward? I mean, I think you have to you know, separate the development community into two pieces. You know, some of the development community builds short term. You know, there's a developer, you'll see a lot of the condos that are being built now. Those developers think in, in five year terms. They're really not thinking out 20 or 30 or 40 years. So, you know, for them, I mean, and, and all of you have seen all of the condos going up in, in Miami now, all these guys think about what's gonna happen over the next five years. And they just build according to what is going to happen over the next five years. They sell these units to, to people. And the only thing that they really try to do is they, they, you know, part of their sales approach, because obviously if you're gonna buy a condo, you're gonna wanna buy it and you're gonna wanna live in it for a long time. So the, the short-term developer, I call them, the condo or whatever, the flipper, that guy, that guy just wants to kind of sell you on a five-year program and then, the, and then he wants government to kind of come in and say, hey, you know what, we're doing this, that, and the other, we're building walls, we're building pumps, you know, everything's gonna be great. Uh, you know, the government has it all under control. That, that, that's one kind of developer. And then you have the other kind of developer, which is the developer, but he's also the property owner. And, and this, a, a municipality can be a property owner, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a county can be a property owner. You know, those sorts of groups have to look at it differently. They have to have a long-term approach to their real estate. You know, it's, it's, it's not a five-year investment. Someone, it's not gonna be someone else's problem in the future. It's gonna be your problem. And what kind of problems can you have in the future? Well, uh, you know, typical, uh, typical financing periods, especially for commercial, I'm not talking about residential. But typically, a commercial developer, when he develops a commercial building, they'll get a five-year mortgage or a 10-year mortgage. Banks are okay lending money on a five or 10-year basis. Five or 10 years is quantifiable. They know they're gonna get their money back. Uh, you know, in, in five or 10 years. So what happens is, is that the, the, the guy that owns this real estate and he's depending upon financing long-term, he's depending upon insurance long-term. This is the guy that is the most concerned. This is the guy, this is me, that is the most proactive guy. I, I actually develop and I own and I operate, you know, so for me, I'm looking at long term, you know, the, uh, the mayor appointed me as the chairman of Miami Beach's response to sea level rise because you know, he understands my commitment long term to, to the community, to, to the environment, and to what you know, we need to do as a, as a community to build resiliency into our system. So, there's a little bit of diverging interests and you know, everyone talks about the development community, but the development community is broken up into many different pieces. And the guys that you always hear about are the guys that are building all these big buildings, they're selling all these condos, people are coming from all over the world to, to buy them. But the other part of the development community is the development community that's here to stay and that includes local, state, and government, as well as private enterprise. So um, I think I've answered, I'm not sure if I've answered your question or not, but that's, that's, that's how the development community is thinking about sea level rise. They're looking for guidance. Um, the, a number of the other panel members here you know, reflected on these issues, not once did you hear that no one's making any loans right now and no one's writing any insurance, although insurance is going up in cost, uh, especially flood insurance. So, uh, you know, we're all in it together. And not only, you know, you know, Miami Beach happens to be, I think uh, 
and Matisse and I are from Miami Beach, you know, we're considered ground zero. But let me tell you something, as Miami Beach goes, Dade County goes, and uh, as Dade County goes, the rest of the world goes because you add two level, two, you know, two feet, just two feet of sea level rise in the world, and you create a lot of issues for a lot of people. And it's not just Dade County or Miami Beach. So, well, thank you very much, Scott. I I, I really enjoy your the division you created there between different types of development. So, Matisse, I know you wanted to chime in, and I, I know that you also are work with a, your company works as a long term. Uh, entity managing some of the properties you construct. So uh, do you see any impediments right now to being more proactive in how you design, develop, and finance for to be more resilient in those properties? Well, um, Miami Beach, um, the narrative of us being ground zero is the opportunity to turn it into being the poster child for a resilient, sustainable, community, coastal community. And that's the way we look at the long-term investor developer, conscientious investor looks at um, the state of the market right now and is very engaged in uh, what is happening at the city level and um, is very, very supportive of the actions that the local government is taking and we're urging them to take these steps faster. Uh, BFE, creating um, a BFE, a free board of one to five. These are things that are already in commission second reading. Um, issues regarding um, mitigation and the future development of our city regarding reinventing it itself. We're a 100-year-old city that has been reinvented about four or five times already. So um, um, we're very engaged in that process. And uh, we don't see um, a dissonance between um, the interests of the city and the interests of the developers. Now, what will happen is the urban migration forcing density in certain areas, core urban areas. I think it's 59% of the world population lives in an urban core right now and about 63% in America. So if we consider, if we still see this trend moving, FHA government um, programs are going to demand in order to get financing for the developer in the future to say, well, if you don't meet certain requirements the way they do today, but they're just a little antiquated. So in this the next cycle of development, they will require you to be resilient and sustainable under certain minimum code requirements that the government has to dictate, has to legislate. But if they haven't legislated them, right now it's the wild, wild west between FEMA and the bank. The bank says you can't, you have a mortgage, you not need flood insurance. You don't get flood insurance, I have to call on your mortgage. Government says to FEMA, increase the cap from a quarter of a million to half a million. Boom. Here goes your premium, plus 25% increase every single year until we get to market rate. So there is no other choice. Does that answer? Yes, I, I, I think that was good. Did you, did you have something more you wanted to add there? I just, you know, it's um, part of the challenges in the development community, and Susie Torrienti is here and she's uh, our head resilience officer, and I can't tell you how happy I am to have her on board. Um, every, every city should have a Susie Torriente because she, she's, she's bringing it all together. There's so, it, sea level rise touches every single part of our community. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. So we're trying to figure out what we do with our new buildings, how high we build them, uh, to what standards we build them. Let me give you an example that'll sort of illustrate the problem that we're having in Miami Beach right now. So you've all been to Lincoln Road, right? Everyone's been to Lincoln Road or everyone knows about Lincoln Road. Okay, so Lincoln Road is probably the most successful 
expensive piece of real estate in all of the southeastern United States. Lincoln Road has a bunch of retail stores that are all at the same elevation. You walk down the street, you look in the store. I think the average elevation of Lincoln Road is somewhere in or the, 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 uh, the sidewalks that you're looking at, somewhere around four or five feet. Base flood elevation today is eight feet. So now we're talking about, okay, let's, let's use a base flood elevation. And by the way, a lot of these buildings were built in the 20s and 30s, many of them historical. So now we have these buildings built at sidewalk level. New requirements come in that Susie and I and everyone are working on, the city of Miami Beach, and everyone's saying, okay, well, let's go to BFE plus three or BFE plus four. And every, for anyone that doesn't know what BFE is, it's base flood elevation. That's that eight feet that I'm talking about, or the nine feet that FEMA says should be your lowest level. So now we're going to go to BFE plus three or four or five feet. Now imagine walking down Lincoln Road at four feet. And the next building that's built, because some buildings were torn down and, and built new, the next building that is built is built at BFE, which is eight or nine plus three feet. Takes you up to 12. So now I'm looking at stores that are at four feet. And I'm looking inside their, their storefronts. And then next thing I know, I walk down the street, and the next door is nine feet higher. How does that work? How does the community accept that? How does the community deal with that? How does the development community deal with that? So those are a lot of the issues that we're running into on Miami Beach as part of the development community is to try to figure out how to build resiliency into our system, but at the same time, retain our culture, retain our way of life. You know, so I hope that illustrates to many of you the problem, especially in our urban areas, especially in our areas that have incredible historical value to us as a community. And, and uh, just, just the way of life that we've become accustomed to. So that is the big challenge. We've taken direction from uh, the Bloomberg Institute out of New York, the, I mean, uh, the Rockefeller, um, other, other communities that have designed to accommodate sea level rise and, 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 and how we can make our, our built environment sort of variable, expandable, so that, you know, as we experience sea level rise, and we don't know what the rate is, and we don't know how fast it's going, but as we do experience it, we can make those adjustments that are required without having to tear down our buildings. So that's, that's been our, our, our one of our biggest challenges from the development community and, and as well as the, from the city of Miami Beach's perspective uh, today. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, Scott. It's very, it's nice to hear that the development community is working together with the local government in trying to understand these challenges. The, I'm sorry? We're not the villain. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, it's good to hear. Yeah. Um, Lenny, um, so as Broward County's Director for Environmental Regulations, you have responsibilities for the county's flood program, and what are some of the ways that uh, we can use the unified civil projections of the Southeast Climate Compact uh, to inform the development of resiliency standards to address sea level rise and some of the community flood risk? We keep hearing to this morning about the importance of flooding and flood risk and those flood insurance rates. So, in, uh, before I came here today, I was reading about Houston actually uh, a week or so ago, and, and this was a comment made by another engineer basically about the, the situation Houston is in right now. And um, it's interesting because this is kind of what we're doing here today, right, which is how are we planning for the next 40 years? How are we going to address the impacts of sea level rise as we, as we develop? And it just sort of, you know, if you reflect back, it, it is something that 
South Florida as a region did about 40 years ago in the late 70s, you know, when the water management district and the new rules, which are, by the way, the rules that are pretty much currently used today, were established that said, this is how you have to address the impacts of development, you know, on water management systems, and basically, you know, that's where all the lakes came from. And, you know, at that time, too, is when FEMA was first coming around. And the FEMA standard is basically setting the base flood. And everybody's familiar with that, and we use that as like, okay, that's the minimum finished floor. We're gonna build our buildings to that. Part of the problem with that is that that's actually what the risk is right that moment. And it's not what the risk might be over the life cycle of the building. So even you know, 40 years ago, while we weren't thinking about sea level rise, they were thinking about, well, you know, right now it's maybe not that developed in Broward County at the time. And you know, what would it look like 30 years down the road when the county was developed? And so they actually created a, a map in Broward County that's typically called the Broward County 100-year map, which was used in conjunction with the FEMA map which rather than being the current risk, was the risk at uh, build out in the county. So they said, what would, what would the elevations be when the county's built out? And in many cases, these elevations were three and four feet higher than what the FEMA numbers were. And starting back then and over you know, the interve intervening decades, you know, they did require development to be built at those higher numbers. And you can see that you know, the county was prosperous and was able to develop, and it, and it did not prevent sort of you know, the economic growth of the county. But you know, as time has gone on, we've seen those, those maps sort of become less and less effective because they've sort of lived out their useful life, and they didn't have sea level rise taken into consideration. And so I, you know, I have some little slides here to just kind of illustrate sort of some of the differences, and they might, they might be hard to read. Oh, and the flood insurance cost didn't even show up. But um, so basically what you have here is, is that you've got the 92 base flood, the yellow line, right? That's eight and a half. And then you can see the change in 2014, the FEMA number went up to nine. And so, you know, um, and the Broward County 100-year map was also nine at that time. In this case, um, you know, the, the structure was built at 1025, and um, I don't know if, it can be read on this screen over here or not, but if, uh, let me just see. Oh, interesting, all right. So, what's that? Oh, no. So anyway, I did have some flood insurance differences here for you, but basically, you know, if you look at that being a foot above, I believe the, the cost per unit was about 800, and if it had been at base flood, it would have been 1,600. So the fact that it was built a little bit higher actually saved this property some money. But you can see that the base flood from FEMA has risen to match the Broad County 100-year map. So over those decades where the BC map used to be much higher than FEMA, it's now sort of equaling FEMA. And then this is a, a Whole Foods market, similar situation. In this case, the Broward County 100-year map was actually eight and a half, and the new FEMA map was 10. And again, you can't really uh, read the numbers on here, but it was like the difference of like a $3,000 premium. But if it had been built down at the Broward County 100-year map, which, by the way, was higher than FEMA, this, was, this building had the uh, fortunate circumstance of being constructed after the FEMA maps were published, but before they took effect. And so the developer, in this case, built this building to the new FEMA number when they could have built it down at eight and a half. And if they had built it down at eight and a half, their annual premium would have been $11,000 for flood insurance. But since it was built to the new FEMA number, but just barely, right, there's no freeboard here. The next time the map comes out, if it's higher, then they could be looking at those substantially higher flood insurance premiums. And then in this case, this is a, um, a home, single family home, that was also built in the 2013 range and you see on here, the Broward County 100-year map was only 12 and a half. And the um, building was built what they thought was a freeboard over that at 14 and a half. But then when the new FEMA map came out, it was actually 15. And so in this particular homeowner, they're paying $3,600 annually for flood insurance, when if they had been at the base flood, it would have been about 1,600 and then if they were one foot above the base flood, which is some of the new FEMA criteria or the new um, 
building code criteria, then their premium would have been 885. And then finally, just to show you, this is uh, Margaritaville in Broward County, and it's relatively new, very large development. And this just shows you the evolution in FEMA base floods and this idea that they change over the lifespan of the building and that our old, our old Broward County map sort of projected build out, but clearly now we're seeing the influences of sea level rise. We're seeing increases in the FEMA base flood elevation. And for this building, you know, it was built at six and a half, which was the 95 FEMA elevation and the Broward County elevation. It was, you know, a decade earlier, it was five and a half, and now here we are in 2014, it's eight. So this brand new building, which was very expensive, is a foot and a half below the base flood. And um, so, you know, as we talk about moving forward, you know, there's this idea that, you know, obviously it has to be pragmatic and scientific and, you know, reasonable, everybody can agree on, but, you know, if you look at the buildings we're building today and you take something like the Broward County 100 year map and you say, you know, let's, let's build a map that shows what the elevations will be in the next 50 years, accounting for sea level rise, accounting for the changes in the storm events, so that we can have a standard upon which we can base those new elevations that we're building. So that during the life cycle, you know, when a homeowner buys a building, like, you know, this, this person here, you know, a year after they buy it, they're already below the base flood. When they thought, oh, it was above the base flood by a substantial amount. And every year, you know, now that we're in actuarial rates, you know, it used to not matter as much because FEMA grandfathered everything in. And as long as you in good faith built at what the numbers were when your, when your house was constructed, they would sort of let you pay the, the regular rate that just as if you were protected. And you see where that got them, $24 billion in debt. And so now we're moving to actuarial rates and so it won't matter that your house was built in accordance with the standard. If it changes, which they are projected to change at least every 10 years, then you're gonna be subject to whatever that new risk is and pay that substantially higher premium. And it may be in the long term, a resiliency issue just for affordability in the region as people, you know, you mentioned four feet below, I can't imagine, you know, if they have to pay flood insurance, what those premiums are, because they just, they just seem to double every foot that you get below the base flood. And so it just becomes unsustainable where, you know, your flood insurance premiums equal your mortgage or your property taxes rates and you know, it just becomes something that if we were to design for that and, and consider that insurance affordability as a aspect that we might be able to avoid. Well, thank you, Lenny, that's great. I really appreciate these slides and kind of you're taking a retrospective view of looking at FEMA-based flood elevations because I've seldom heard people kind of go backwards and look at those older maps and put lines on a picture showing both the elevations and the financial differences that really makes. So I think that really does, uh, I was going to ask you about uh, ways that regionally that you can advance standards for planning and risk reduction, and what are some of the economic drivers, and I think you've made a very good case that this is one of them. If we take that one step further, you looked backwards and showed us how things have changed up until today, and we can see these economic impacts. So what about going forward now that FEMA is looking increasingly at trying to understand how they are going to integrate climate change and civil rise into future maps? Because none of the maps to date have actually done that. Right, and, and I, you know, as far as FEMA goes, they're, they're basically putting out a map that says, this is your risk today. And people are paying a premium based on their current risk. So I think FEMA really struggles with this idea that you know, let's, let's take into account sea level rise and calculate some future risk and charge you a premium today based on that future risk. Now, that might have the effect of making somebody think about, you know, what they're going to build, and so that might have its merit, but, but again, they're paying for not what their risk is right this, this moment. So a lot of what FEMA is looking at is putting out tools for local governments that include sea level rise. You know, one of the things that we were looking at in Broward is we do have a, a fairly robust FEMA model now. And if you take that and you change the antecedent conditions and you add in sea level rise, you'll be able to rerun that model and come up with what those base floods would be if sea level rise were taken into account. So I'm not sure that you'll ever get to the point where the FEMA map actually fully includes sea level rise simply because of the economic impact on the premium before the risk is realized. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Lenny. So I guess 
Matisse, you talked also a little bit about insurance. So is are either one of these development communities that you've both discussed, either kind of the short-term build it and sell it and within a five-year period, or the long-term owners, managers, are either one of those communities, uh, how active are they in discussing some of these details that Lenny has pointed out? Um, a testament to that is the very fact that Scott um, heads, uh, chairs the Blue Ribbon Panel on Sea Level Rise as a developer. Um, we, um, the same problem that Scott identified of the four feet that he has in South Beach, I have in North Beach. And if we're a microcosm of um, South Florida in general, uh, put everything you have, the problems you have in all of the counties surrounding us, put it on speed and put it into Miami Beach. Now, um, if you were talking, we spoke a lot earlier today about adaptation. Well, how does that manifest itself in reality? So if you can go back to that first slide of yours and imagine, yeah, imagine, this was two separate structures. And it's not hard to imagine how you would lower one to the first yellow line and raise one to above the red line and understand what happens to that neighbor's property that is at the yellow line? Did his value go up or down? How much, we can argue, but you know his value went down. And as that keeps on adapting, people are keep on moving it up, moving it up, and moving it up. And those person, the person who built originally <coughs> is gonna be in a very, very, very hard economic situation. One is, there's going to be a point when we create a standard for South Florida, and whoever doesn't meet that standard is not going to be insurable because it's going to be an understandable standard. So this brings us back to where we started again a little yeah, bit. It's, we, and it's are back you to going to do that proactively even before some of these standards might come out? Because Thank if you. you are a long-term manager of a property, but Assuming that you will then, what about, how do you get to those short-term people? Is there any way? Well, well, first of all, in Miami Beach, we're referring, we're discussing, for example, on a retail basis right now, to increase the, f the height of the first floor to 30 feet instead of base flood to the uh, built-out first floor, but think about it from the top. And this way, if the, f the road is raised six feet, you still have all the mechanical inside to be able to, run, to raise it. There are all kinds of ideas like that, but once a standard is adopted, think about what the government, the federal government regulators are gonna do. They're gonna say anybody not on the standard is not sure. And, and, and going back to that point, which is the most troubling part about all of this is, what about all of our historical buildings and how do we treat them and do they become uninsurable and do they flood uh, at high tide and how we deal with those situations. That's one of the most difficult things that Miami Beach is, is trying to, to grapple with and you know what do we do? Do we we change our, our heritage and our culture. I mean, it, it might be that we do. Do you raise these historical structures? Very difficult, very expensive, unlikely that uh, the private sector would do that. So all of these challenges, and you see that red line that's on that building? Well, imagine that red line being five feet higher on many of our buildings. So that's that's... That's the struggle, and I think it was insurance you were talking about and financing you were talking about. Those are the things that might determine whether or not we keep our historical buildings or we can't keep our historical buildings. So it's, a, it's an issue that, you know, or maybe there's another solution. We don't know. Maybe 40, 50 years or 60 years down the road, someone a lot smarter than us comes up with, Another solution, maybe the effects of sea level rise are mitigated. We don't know. 
maybe the young kids who really are, are in tune with this problem and who recognize that this is really their issue. You know, maybe they start to focus on how to reverse the effects of sea level rise. And everyone tells us it's already baked in, it's already going to happen. Well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily fully believe that. And I don't want to believe that. Sure. Okay. I don't think as businessmen we are ever involved in trying to tell the future. We're about mitigating risk, about placing money responsibly, objectively, and seeing what we can do the best of it. To well, Scott is talking, speaking of a sensitivity towards cultural heritage that sometimes I joke to say you're holding on to an anchor thinking it's going to float. And, but yet, but yet, if in fact um, this new paradigm is a matter of fact, or is it something that can be managed, is a question that we don't know yet. And the question is risk on both sides. And that is where the community is at odds right now. And it's creating a very, very, very hard time for government to make policy. Very good. Lenny, I know you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, basically on the, um, the subject of the, the free board you're talking about or building the new buildings and what happens to the old ones. I mean, there's a few things that we as local governments do when we start to plan for the future like this. And one is when you start to put in those standards that say new construction has to be at these higher elevations because you know, we know we want to account for sea level rise or you create any of these other higher regulatory standards, FEMA does give us credit for that. So that immediately benefits the existing structures that might be below the base flood in the form of lower flood insurance premiums. Like a lot of these numbers, which I did have on here, you know, in Broward County, if you're in the unincorporated area, you get a 15% discount off of that number. If you're in Fort Lauderdale, it's a 20% discount. It can go as high as 40% off of that number if the community has enacted enough resiliency standards to lower the risk. So that's the first thing you can do for those structures without making any other changes other than looking at higher standards, you can reduce those flood insurance premiums for those lower properties. The other thing you can do is, is as I mentioned, you know, with um, if you look at this, you got the yellow line and then the blue line, right? So the FEMA elevations went up between 92 and 2014. But what that doesn't show you is, is that in 92, even though the numbers were lower, 80% of the county was in a floodplain. But by 2014, only 40% of the county was in a floodplain because of all the changes that were made in the county with the design standards, with water management, with you know, the way that the canals and lakes are connected. And so you can, through those retrofitting um, you know, devices basically also bring down that risk and bring down those numbers. And so you might be able to take parts that were formerly in the floodplain and facing these really high numbers just completely out of the floodplain through those actions that you might take. So there's two sides to that, right? There's, you know, you build new stuff higher and you, you create these newer standards, but the, the flip side of that is you, you lower flood insurance premiums and you potentially lower flood risk throughout the community also. And through both of those, you benefit the properties that got left behind. Well, very good. Well, I, I think I, I personally was a little bit surprised in our previous panel that there wasn't a little more consideration in the financial markets with some of these issues. The fact that you're, you know, you're talking about radical things there in Miami Beach. I mean, 30-foot ceiling elevations for a first floor. I mean, that's, that's quite amazing. So you're doing so many things, raising roads, installing pumps, looking at these potential new ordinance changes. What do you see? Have there been kind of localized discussions within finance related to development uh, taking place out there on Miami Beach? I'm going to let Matisse take that one. <laughs> and he's the New York finance guy. You're welcome. The, uh, <laughs> I think that when we look at a, as many of our speakers um, alluded to and hinted to before, whether it was in the insurance or in the funding, um, they were referring to a very macro level and also on a municipal level. 
But when you come to look at things from the um, developer's perspective, from his property out to the world in his prison, as opposed to a one little piece in a much bigger puzzle, I think the um, analysis, the um, perceived um, advantages that might have for local financing are pretty much gone. Florida pays a higher interest rate de facto than its northern city, um, states, whether it's government financing or local financing. Local financing, local banks that are balance sheet um, funders have a premium to do business in Florida. Is that factored in? Is it not factored in? Well, that's what they tell us. FEMA has not released to the NFIP their actuarial charge. So we don't know what is factored in or not. But we do know that we pay 30% of the premiums for the entire nation. So the fact is it's hard to finance until there is a clear message and a clear, um, I would say, holistic um, legislation regarding where buildings should begin and end. Um, it will be more expensive to do construction finance. It will be available. Miami Beach, we have a wonderful problem that we don't have much supply. So, um, but uh, yes, there is a tremendous premium for that. Well, thank you. I'd like to open it up and see if there are any questions from the audience right now. Yes, if you could come please up to a microphone. Yeah, my name is David Enfield. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of wondering when I was hearing about uh, first floor, uh, what was it, 30 feet or whatever, interesting idea, kind of like some of the houses you see in the Florida Keys, right? They, uh, The first floor has blowout walls and uh, the first livable floor is above that. So it's an interesting idea. And I'm wondering from a construction point of view, what can be done for construction of family, single family homes to make them um, more flexible in terms of what can be done in the future. Can you design a home in such a way that you can, if necessary, 15, 20 years hence, uh, it makes sense to put jacks under the home and lift it up. But the capability of doing that would have to have been put into the design and construction of the home initially. So this is a different kind of resilience, if you will, it's an adaptable one. And I'm just wondering if you could comment about the feasibility of doing that. Uh, I can I can try, I'm, I'm actually, I was a general contractor for 25 years before I was a developer. Um, we are, we are, you know, it's, Matisse was talking about 30 foot high ceilings in commercial properties because the commercial properties are, are, are connected usually, and you have to match everything that's next to you, and then that 30 feet would allow you in the future to raise your ceiling heights when everyone else does. Residential is obviously different. It's, there's, there's, there's separation between you and your neighbor. So your, may, your neighbor may be at one elevation. You may want to build, and this is, this is happening to us all the time right now in Miami Beach. All these new homes that are being built, you know, we want to make sure that they're built as high as, the argument is, is you can't let them build too high because it's going to dwarf the house next to it and it's going to look odd. And the water that's coming on your property is going to flow somehow into their property. So it creates this, this problem between property owners. So. I haven't even thought about your suggestion. It's actually a great suggestion uh, to maybe write that into the code where, where you know, if these houses do have to get 
risen that they can be done easily. I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. You know, houses are built on basically stilts. You know, those are your foundations. Those are your, your piles. The piles are, are kind of sticks, and your house rests on these sticks. So I think it's an excellent idea, and it's something that in our blue ribbon panel, I am certainly going to, uh, to address. So thank you for that one. I haven't really considered it, but it's a good one. I mean, if you if it's kind of like in San Francisco, you know, you build it for earthquakes, you know, and uh, we need to to build for potential future for increases in height. So it's a it's a great suggestion. Combine the Amsterdam with the Tokyo, and you have uh, Amsterdam and Miami, uh, Amsterdam and Tokyo to get yeah. to Miami Beach. Yeah. Okay, the <laughs> earth, you have the earthquake um, buffer, and you have the hydraulic in Amsterdam for the homes. Yeah. Next way, Commissioner Carruthers. Sure, a um, couple, of, couple of comments. First about um, the elevating the homes. Um, it, we, we actually have seen that in Key West, particularly wood frame homes, which are much more, it's much more cost effective to do that. Homes built on grade and CBS homes, it's a whole different issue. Um, but you talked a little bit about the cultural uh, impediments to changing the what the character of a community is and and that was a real cons consideration for us in in Key West but we had a referendum because throughout the Keys and Key West and everywhere else in the Keys we actually have a written in code that uh, that buildings can't exceed a particular height and in Key West in the historic district it was 25 feet well um, we actually passed a referendum by 81 percent um, which surprised, I think, everybody at the amount of support to allow people to exceed that height, all of our height limits, so that folks could elevate up to three feet above uh, BFE. So I think when people are, are faced with decisions about whether they're going to be able to continue to maintain their way of life um, or maybe you know li get a little more shadow from their neighbor, they're going to vote for a little more shadow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, about FEMA and NFIP too, because there's been some talk about them not having released their actuarial rates. And I think that the reason that they haven't released them is because they don't know what they are. And the reason they don't know what they are is because f and the NFIP is not operated like a normal insurance company. They, they don't invest their premiums. Um, they give away 30% of their premiums to the write your own companies simply for, the, the, for sending us a bill when they carry no risk. They haven't really looked at at what those numbers would be. Um, I can tell you that this was verified by Commissioner, our insurance commissioner, Kevin McCarty, not, not too long ago. And I was in a meeting um, with FEMA uh, about a year ago, uh, or t I guess now two years ago, after Bigger Waters. And there was a, a, a homeowner in the Keys who had been paying $1,900 about for his flood insurance. He was built on grade. The home was valued at about $350,000. He'd had one, one claim over the 20 years, and it was after Hurricane Wilma. And he went to sell his home, and the potential buyer got a new quote for his, for his flood insurance, which was $49,000. So by that theory, he could completely rip down and replace his home every seven years. And I was in this meeting with FEMA, and I said, there's no way that that's actuarially sound. And it was th uh, probably the ultimate sign of bureaucracy when he, he was just like a robot. Well, that's what the numbers say. That's what the numbers say. It's, it's not what the numbers say. And you're right that Florida is, is we are the donor state. Um, we are the biggest uh, players here. And one of the issues that, that we believe is going on is that although there are 30 rating categories, uh, territories within FEMA in terms of where you live, if you're in a riverine, potentially flooding area, there's only one rate. So. So your, your risk is not accurate. So um, with that said, um, through the Florida Association of Counties, we want to drive the bus in terms of NFIP reauthorization. And we've been reaching out to uh, other entities, Florida Builders, Real Estate Banking Association. And over the next um, year, uh, I think you will start to see a lot more um, invigorated response to NFIP and so that we can actually get a program that benefits folks um, and certainly doesn't leave us as Floridians on the hook for the whole program. I'd very much like to help you in any way I can. We have in Miami Beach, how many homes are being demolished as opposed to being renovated? Almost all of them. People who buy a new home in Miami Beach say, why should I keep this home? 
It's a very simple thing. They're going to have to increase the grade, raise the grade, and they want to build a modern home. There's no economic viability to it. Multifamily buildings. I was paying 1,400 under the 1974 grandfather, and now I'm paying nine to 18 to 25 thousand dollars for the same property. The economics are just not there. Well, thank you for the comments about the FEMA flood insurance. I think I, I always find it very interesting. Yes, we are a significant here in Florida, a significant part of the flood insurance program at the national level, and I always find it kind of amusing this idea that. Uh, we are a donor state. Um, I think most of us are probably donors when it comes to our car insurance and our homeowner's insurance. And the statistics would bear out that the entire amount of money that Florida has paid into the NFIP since its inception could actually be wiped out fairly easily by a good direct hit here down in Miami-Dade. So I think, you know, it's, it's hard to compare it to the actuarial tables that we use, say, for life insurance or homeowner's insurance, which are a lot more accurate and easy to calculate. But again, yes, the FEMA clearly does not operate as a regular insurance company, but of course, go to Congress with that one. The Congress is the one telling them how they must operate in most of these instances. So. Uh, yeah, and, and FEMA is the first one to admit they've, uh, National Academies of Science have recently come out with a couple of different reports on affordability of the National Flood Insurance Program, because Congress requires that now from FEMA to study that. And the National Academies of Science have basically said, we can't even make projections about the affordability impacts of different options because FEMA does not yet have enough data. Historically, they just don't have the data on most of the uh, structures that they have policies on. So a lot of challenges there in data and management for FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program. Yeah, I mean, I can just say on the, the FEMA front, you know, it's seeing all the policy premium and then being, you know, the regulator, we don't see very many claims in relationship to the amount of money. And if you look at somewhere like Houston, um, they're like 20 feet higher above sea level than we are. And in the last 40 years, they've had 26 significant events that have flooded homes. So like every two years, they're flooding a bunch of homes. And I don't think you see that in our region. Other questions? One last question. Lenny, you were talking about the, the Broward 100-year flood map. Are you planning to regenerate that 100-year that flood map? And I, I also have a comment after you answer that question. Um, it, it's a possibility, yes, and we've, we've been discussing it. And my, my comment is, is that as development moves forward and they elevate the homes and they elevate uh, the different properties, that has to be done hand in hand with government. Otherwise, you just are creating properties that are on an island and the roads will not allow access to those properties. So we can't just look to the developers to raise the properties. It has to be done in conjunction with aggressive capital improvement plans that allow the roads and the access to be provided as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to ask you to give a round of applause for our panelists here and for sharing their expertise and insights.